welcome to Furious Driving and today we've gone slightly further than usual to review the Volvo V90 Cross Country. Nearly 500 miles in fact to this, the shores of Loch Lomond. So here we are in the Volvo V90 Cross Country about to set off on the greatest test of any family hauler. Yes, the family road trip and oh my god we are camping. This cannot go well. This is quite a big car but we've made two seriously big errors. First of all we've taken self-inflating mattresses which we've borrowed which are actually bigger than the tent when they're packed up and my wife's into paddle boarding so we've got paddle boards and loads of life preserver things as well so this car is fuller than any car has any right to be uh, rearward vision is a thing of the past but in about eight hours time we'll be in scotland and then we'll see how well the car did so this will be a bit different a car review meets travelogue so the first challenge after the physically fitting everything in was how comfortable is this thing over an entire day spent in the car and the answer is pretty good over many hours of badly surfaced motorway the car was insulating us from the road noise and wind noise and with fm dab bluetooth and of course carplay we could have our choice of audio entertainment to keep us amused hour after hour the cup holders are well placed for everybody and there's plenty of usb power points to keep all our devices charged as well this is modern age traveling after all there are a couple of 2 litre petrol engines and this 2 litre diesel. The B5 makes 235 horsepower, 0 to 60 in 7.5 seconds, 45 mpg, which we easily saw on the motorway, and CO2 emissions of 164 grams. And most importantly, the boot is 560 litres big. That is very big. And all this action starts at £53,000. Two hours, about 100 and something miles. See if we can, oh god, extricate a flask, make a cup of tea. The route is being calculated. trying pilot assist we've got a long way to go so I figured I'd make it easy and do the self-driving sort of pilot assist thing which steers and brakes and holds the traffic speed for you but it's very strange it's very weird using it in the first place pilot assist manages to track the road ahead by using cameras and radar to follow the lines and work out where you're going on a motor or dual carriageway it does insist that you keep a hand on the wheel so it knows you're still awake but it does have a tendency to want to hug the left hand side of the lane which can be a little bit disconcerting especially in roadworks when the lanes are narrow or if there's a wide vehicle or someone who's a bit wandery in the left hand lane second stop another cup of tea it's now somewhere on the M6, about another 250 miles to go probably. Then we're there and it's only 16 degrees, it's getting colder by the minute. T-Bay services, highlight of the drive. That big red writing like it's an emergency farm shop. Quick, we need pate. Emergency locally produced pate. Please follow the route for There's a caravan miles. park, we can here. Just stay, shall we? Gordon, well, that looks nice, is there a lake down there? There was a lake and pate and many other locally produced specialities and delicacies even some sheepskin rugs. This is a great place to take a break and get away from the motorway for a few minutes. I don't want the caravan much, but I do quite like the idea of that. Tow behind a classic car, that'd be really cool. Five. So entering Scotland in three, two, one. We're not in yet. Minus one, minus two. Welcome, Welcome to, to Scotland. Scotland! Welcome? <laughs> it's not Transylvania. And finally the landscape changes. The motorway gives way to the city streets of Glasgow and finally onto the countryside. The snap nav has been very good, it knows exactly where it's going, but it's not always clear where the lanes are on some particularly busy or confusing junctions. 
and then finally we can see we're close at last. The campsite was nowhere near as rugged as we were led to believe. We were told we needed an off-roader just to get into the site. So, 440 miles, 10 hours, and now we're here. We need to find a way of getting the tent into that spot there. Like, quite honestly, I think I'd rather drive another 440 miles and put a tent up. Okay. So here we are, it's the morning now. Oh, well, sleeping in a tent, which is never that great. But the car was fantastic. I actually thought about getting out and sleeping in this thing last night. And the reason this car, despite being pretty huge, is so full, is basically because this thing. Because Mrs. Furious wanted to take this thing on the big pond over there. I'll climb in and talk to you because it's quite windy out there. So the car yesterday, I'll talk about yesterday's journey, it was absolutely fantastic and 10 hours over everything from country lanes to motorways. We got out feeling not at all bothered, tired, feel more tired after sleeping in the tent. So as a long distance cruiser, this thing is absolutely fantastic. We're left with a full tank of diesel from Kent to Scotland and it's still only used just over half a tank of fuel. So we could almost drive all the way home again. Without the weight of all the food and drink we've been carrying on the way here, maybe we even could go all the way home again. It's so relaxing to drive. I tried the, the pilot assist for a while. And in the end, I think I found um, just regular adaptive crews way more relaxing over a long drive, over a long period. If it had been a classic car adventure, this kind of distance and that kind of time would have been a bit of a challenge. But this thing just ate it up, no problem at all. Here we go. Can't go to Scotland and not do a distillery. So here, it moves down to the Glen Goyne Distillery. I'm not looking forward to it. Where you the don't child have is, to go in even. Charles is not looking forward to it. Have a look in the shop, surely. You can smell it in the air, it's fantastic. I've never tried Glen Goyne, but maybe I'll visit the gift shop and find out what it's like. They've even got a waterfall here. I was rather expecting the waterfall to be bigger. This is astonishingly tranquil. It's not exactly rushing hurly-burly outside, but this is incredibly peaceful. And tons of mosquitoes. And tons of mosquitoes, but there is a whiskey barge over there, which makes it even nicer. There you go. That's the actual waterfall. I guess this is the waterfall that supplies the Glen Goyne whiskey. We've not done the tour because as a child who does not want to spend 75 minutes looking at whiskey, kids are weird. Wow, isn't it beautiful? Just up the side of the road. Yeah, perfect place to stop for a picnic. So, lots of dogs on this beach. Hopefully none of them will come and steal our sandwiches or drink our tea while I go and do some intervalometer stop motion photos of the lake. I'm sitting on a rock. He is sitting on a rock. On the outside it is unmistakably a Volvo. We've got the same styling cues we've had for the last few years with the exaggerated haunches and strong shoulder line going out into a strong swage line as well. But being the cross country, we've now got this extra black plastic cladding and the car's sitting a little bit higher as well. So if we need to go over some bumpy stuff, it's not really gonna be a problem. So it's eight o'clock on Wednesday. This is our third day of holiday, second day on the campsite and Wow, are we glad we're not in a hotel room somewhere with room service knocking on the door, waking up in a soft bed. Because it looks quite bright and sunny over the mountains over there, but the wind is howling. Someone said they thought our tent was going to lift off in the night. The Volvo, though, is proving exemplary still. First of all, as a wind break, because there's nowhere else we can light our gas stove to cook some breakfast. And secondly, let me take you inside it with its many, many charging points. We've got two USB A's here in this center cubby hole, charging both the phones, which are almost dead. And in the back, we've got two USB C's, which are charging other devices, a Nintendo, essentially, and the power bank, which has been charging stuff in the tent. And, uh, oh, did I mention there are gnats are generally a huge problem in this part of Scotland. However, 
we've been really lucky because it's so massively windy uh, we haven't had to worry about that meanwhile the interior of the car is extremely comfortable and roomy these tall but slim seats I mean there's tons of room in the back and for rear seat passengers it's absolutely fantastic because as well as having twin air vents which you can turn off and on you've got your own individual air conditioning level controls in the back and heated rear seats back here as well yeah who needs room service for the Italian Riviera we've got the side of a Volvo and a fence and some very very runny scrambled eggs with grass in it ah <laughs> oh, dear me we do have some very nice alloy wheels though And now a day out in a town. Given the size of the car, getting into small parking spaces can feel cramped, but the top-down cameras make it easy to position the car in a very, very tight and accurate place. Now, we might have gone for the fishies in the aquarium, but we stayed here for the ship. Now, you may remember, about a year ago, we went and looked at the Medway Queen. It's sitting in Rochester in Kent. This is almost a sister ship to it, the Maid of the Lock, which sadly isn't in the water at the moment. There's actual live steam happening in the Ballock Steam Slipway. Built 1902, restored just not a couple of years ago. They had to restore the steam winch first before they could pull the ship out of the water for hull repairs. She's a very late model, one of the last paddle steamers built in 1953, and Loch Lomond's last ever paddle steamer. Despite being so late, it is still following the Art Deco style of the great steamers, and so hopefully we'll be able to come back in a little while and go out on the water and maybe do a full review of this ship. Right, well, it's morning again, and today the wind has dropped to below force 19, which means the midges are out. The tiny little mosquitoes that crawl in your ears and buzz up your nose are just everywhere. So climbing in the car to do a little walk around review of the interior seems like a good opportunity to take this net thing off my head. Right, so let's have a look at this incredible interior. I think it's safe to say that Volvo do some of the nicest, classiest, just effortlessly cool interiors on the market colour combination, the materials combination, it just works and looks so good. So we've got a big flat dashboard, it comes a long way from the screen which is quite heavily rate. It's kind of a leather material at the top so excellent tea shelf opportunities, camping situation, excellent tin mug opportunities, enamel mug if you like, um, which continues into the door tops which has got a little bit of very lightly contrasting grey stitching to the black which all looks very very attractive indeed and then the dashboard of the v90 is very slab like and it comes down all not quite vertically uh, with a leathery feeling material above this beautiful i don't know what kind of wood you would call this but it's got heavily grained and textured you can feel it through the surface it's not smoothed over it's very natural feeling in this car it's quite a dark color so it's all very subdued but then that's lit up and contrasted with this strip of uh, shiny metal and then everything else is a creamy off-white. I mean obviously being camping I'm vaguely wishing they'd given us an entirely brown interior <laughs> but uh, this does look rather nice. And then the doors carry on with this theme of bare metal and naked wood. It just looks so so good. I'm running out of superlatives to say. So as we step into the doors themselves you'll notice we've got the memory seats on the passenger door as well as the driver's door. I'm gonna look at the driver's door because it is nearer and easier to reach. Um, we've got twin Bowers and Wilkins speakers in both doors. All our controls in the door arm, which is nicely padded, creamy leather again, and more padded, creamy area here. Big door pockets and a third speaker. So each front door has got three loudspeakers. That's six speakers in the doors. Plus we have the Bowers and Wilkins center stage speaker up in the middle. So the audio is absolutely glorious. We've got the same infotainment screen, which got the sat nav, DAB, FM, all the rest of it, Bluetooth. Then when the phone's connected, you've also got CarPlay and Android Auto all in this area here. So one thing that was a 
bit confusing for Mrs. Furious because she'd not used this screen before, didn't remember using the screen, was finding the heating and ventilation controls. Because maybe although this is lovely and clean design, for people who aren't familiar with it, it's not the most user friendly at first. And then when you change your temperature, you then do have to go back in the room to turn it off and close it and things to get back to the radio or the navigation. It's, yeah, it can, I like the design and the cleanliness, but I kind of feel like it's too much on the screen. What we have got below that is the volume for the radio and the home button to get you back to the home position of the the main screen. Either side of that we've got this big, big ventilation shaft basically and nice heavy metal. It feels like a big high quality chunky item that will last for years and years which is I guess fairly normal for Volvo's quality. Over to the steering wheel. On the left we have many functions on the light stalk, many functions on the wiper stalk. This two-tone steering wheel is surprisingly small considering how big the car is. We have a nice little Volvo logo in the centre. The left-hand batch of buttons is all for your many, many driving options, um, whether it's pilot assist or basic cruise are all done through this. And the right-hand one is for audio and trip computer kind of stuff. Either side, we've got miniature versions of the massive air, air vent shaft things. Again, nice solid metal feeling. Uh, controls there surrounded by more bits of metal and more of this bare wood which looks absolutely beautiful. Down below we have got a little pistol pocket flock lined just to keep you odds and sods safe and in the centre which can be concealed oops, by more beautiful wood. This just looks and feels so much more tasteful and classy than plastic fake piano black nonsense. This is absolutely lovely. Underneath that we have got twin cup holders at the back with an inductive charging pad. You do have to turn the inductive charging pad on at the beginning, otherwise it will be default turned off uh, for medical warning reasons. Behind that we've got a 12 volt socket and a place we can lose stuff down there. With glasses and phones and things. Automatic gear shift only. Manual is not an option on this car, unfortunately. Uh, this is Volvo's standard little triangular pyramid thing, which you nudge backwards and forwards, all electronic links. Starting with the turny dial, turn the power on and off, and drive select. So we can choose comfort, eco, individual. And because this is the four wheel drive version, we've got the off road setting as well. So we can take this thing to some serious locations. I'm going to put it back to comfort today. Finally, we have got a big, very big cubby hole down here. Lots of room for activities, which has got twin USB A's. One of them is the CarPlay port. And up above, we do have a great big pandemic sunroof. Now something worth noting, when you see this car in the dark, it is like walking into a high-end nightclub or hotel or something. Everything is illuminated very subtly with little LEDs hidden all over the place inside the doors, around the door shuts and the kick plates. Now the dynamic modes do make a big difference. Pop it into dynamic and suddenly the car does become a much more exciting performing thing. It's a double tap from neutral into drive and a double from neutral to reverse and I've found this on Volvos in the past if you rush it you wind up stuck in neutral and uh, not going anywhere and I know it's just me not really a fault of the car but I keep on going for the volume control rather than the start stop control so I turn I keep trying to turn the car on by turning the radio up which it turns out doesn't work with it in dynamic mode you can hustle along quite quickly. The body control does tighten up a lot, but there is still a fair bit of float over the cresty bumps and things. There we go, little crest. Wasn't too bad that time. In comfort mode, it's far more gentle over the bumps. In dynamic, you can feel it trying to pull itself back down onto the wheels. Give you a bit more of a controlled ride. The gearbox changes a little bit more excitingly as well, so you can hustle through the bends just a little bit more enthusiastically. Believe it or not, this is a 60 mile an hour road, but it feels fast at 35.
As always, I would prefer to drive this car with a manual gearbox. The automatic is extremely smooth. The eight-speed just flips up and down through the gears quite happily. It only really gets caught out on some of these switchback roads when you suddenly find yourself going up a very steep hill with no warning whatsoever and it's not in the right gear and you shuffle down two or three gears to get to the right place. Whereas if you're a manual car, you would know you were coming into that situation and you would have put it into second before you got into the corner. So apparently this is what we came all the way out here for, to go and sit on a board in the middle of a pond. So the reason we wanted such an incredible car with all the capacity to go anywhere and load stuff up in it as the V90 was to take this paddleboard thing out onto the locks once we got here into the wild blue yonder, the wilderness of Scotland. And so we did have the massive boot and of course if we needed to get away from the beach at the campsite we could have driven down any number of tracks and things but of course they had a perfect beach here so we didn't even have to do that. Now you might think being such a big car, it would be a bit of a nightmare to thread down these little tiny Scottish country lanes. But in fact, it's one of those cars that really does shrink around you and you can place it exactly where you want. It is big, but you can see the haunches of the back of the car in the mirrors really cleanly. And the front of the car, it dips down quite sharply so you can tell where the corners are. And the wheels are fairly far out into the corners, certainly at the front. So you can tell where you are on the road all the time. And when stuff comes the other way, you can get yourself over to the edge touch wood without damaging the alloys. So far so good. Now I'm driving in comfort mode and it is very very smooth, very very quiet. The diesel you only really hear it as the revs peak up a little bit. Most of the time it's really unobtrusive, really quiet. The steering is light and there's enough feedback to keep it broadly entertaining. You stick it into the uh, dynamic mode and it just picks up all the performance and the responsiveness and tightens the steering just a little bit more so you do get a bit more feedback and you can chuck it through the corners with a bit more gusto. Most of the time though, it's the kind of car that's quite happy in comfort. Visibility is good, you've got a fairly high belt line but it's below your own shoulder line so you still have a nice glass house in the car and you can see fairly clearly. The only time I've had any kind of issues with this car is because it's a long low form factor. Sometimes the side turnings pulling out onto this little narrow lanes can be a bit tricky trying to see around the hedges. But for the most part it is very easy to use. You can feel the suspension moving on the humpier, lumpier bits but it gives you a nice composed ride. It doesn't leave you feeling car sick or shaken about even though it's jacked up taller than normal. It is just a kind of car that is perfect. It can go anywhere, it just doesn't shout about it. In fact it's ideal for the kind of person who wants to be able to go anywhere and do anything and be practical and ready for in any situation but doesn't want to make a big song and dance about it they've not got the lifted Land Rover with all the ladders down the side of it that kind of tells everyone I'm ready for the apocalypse I'm prepping right now it's very much more subtle more discreet you know if, if the worst happens we can handle this but the rest of the time I want my heated leather and air conditioning and USBs in the back there's, there's no, no compromises here at all if the world ends this Volvo will cope in the meantime though we're comfortable. Now doing manoeuvres in this car, which would be impossible considering how big the thing is, are really easy with that top-down camera. You can position it almost to the millimetre and do some really quite precise turns. It is a big car. When I first saw it in the driveway, I just thought, what have I done? Why have I agreed to drive a car this huge all this way into such a small place? But in fact, it has been not a problem at all. The funny thing is about holiday cars is they always become part of the holiday and part of the family. They, they, they are as much of the holiday as everything else. You always remember that Toyota RAV4 or that Ford Focus you rented because it became part of the story.
and in this case we've been to some pretty rugged and remote locations and we've been to some towns as well and this has taken everything completely in its stride. If we'd taken just a regular SUV type car, the paddleboard and the um, buoyancy aid life jacket things would have taken the entire boot on their own. We'd have had no chance to get in the tent and we've borrowed a self-inflating mattress which wrapped up is actually bigger than the tent. There's no way we could have done this holiday in anything but this car or some kind of minibus. This is possibly the ultimate evolution of the estate car, giving you all the space in the world plus as much luxury as you could hope for. Well, thank you for joining me out in this absolutely beautiful V90 cross country. It has been a real treat taking this car on holiday and it has become part of the family almost. If you've enjoyed this, please, as always, do hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different.